Wonderful. Thanks. Thanks, Guy, and it's, um, it's great. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, so as Guy said, um, today I'm going to talk about some of my PhD work um, around the development of a risk prediction model. But I thought actually, um, you know, data research is something that's quite a hot topic here at UCLH at the moment. You know, we've got Epic Beacon, lots and lots of, um, lots of, um, lots of um, stuff going on with um, data and risk prediction keeps coming up over and over again. So I thought it'd help if I just um, put it all into context to help people understand actually what risk prediction actually is and how, um, how these models are developed without going too deep into the statistics. Um, so I'm gonna start, I'm gonna go into my presentation and talk a little bit about prognostic research, um, prognosis research. Um, oops, sorry, um, just need to try and move this. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of in, an introduction into the models used and um, the statistics, um, but just very briefly to help you understand because it isn't really that complicated. Um, and some of the models that I've developed. So um, what is prediction? I think, you know, people sometimes get a bit scared when they think about prediction and, you know, what, what prediction models are. But, you know, you have to remember that you predict things every day of your life. Um, at the moment, it's raining where I am and um, I was brought up in the northwest and it was permanently raining. So, you know, I would never go out with out my umbrella and so you know I'd constantly be predicting the weather and um, sometimes you get it right but as you can see on the other image sometimes you would get it wrong and you'd be walking around with an umbrella when you really didn't need it um, so you know if you're making all these predictions in your mind every day you have to remember that sometimes you do it when you're an experienced practitioner with patients as well sometimes with the in clinic and you'd kind of know the people that would be more likely to have something like nausea and vomiting or certain toxicities just by looking at them and talking to them um, but you just want that little bit more certainty when it comes to patients you don't want to use your kind of brain predictions and this is you know a little bit of the concepts behind prediction modeling um so it's useful um so as i said it's useful to identify the different factors um that reduce the risk of patients suffering things like side effects um you know the factors that might lead to disease um, and in clinical medicine, you have um, something called prognosis, and it's actually, um, oops, I can't see my slides for some reason. Ooh. Oh, there we go. Sorry. Um, so in clinical med medicine, prognosis refers to the risk of future health outcomes in people with a given disease or health condition. So um, when, when we do prognosis research, we're actually investigating future outcomes of people. So this is where, you know, this is where we sometimes refer to it as risk prediction and some people refer to it as prognostic modeling or prognostic research. Um, and so prognostic research aims to inform clinical practice and improve patient care. Um, so in terms of like um, develop, you know, developing a kind of research strategy for, you know, predicting the future, um, there was a framework developed by the Progress um, Group, and um, it's called the Progress framework and what happened was um, there was loads and loads of these prediction models being made but none of them were being used in practice and so what they did was they developed a bit of a framework and a strategy so that um, so that people could um, you know actually have models that could be used in practice so 
what um what they developed there's four papers that are published in the bmj and in um plus medicine um, and they go through four different themes it's around um and it goes from you know predicting big populations of patients so you might have um a prognosis where you've got um comparing survival between different countries for example um to actually individualizing different risks for pa patients and that is prognostic model research where you have individual factors for different patients um, that will help you um, predict what their outcomes will be and you know you I'll kind of talk about this in a bit more depth now um, so what we do when we develop a risk prediction or a prognostic model is we use multiple factors about patients and we combine them together, bring them all together, and then it gives you the risk of a patient having a particular outcome or event. And so, as I said, you know, I used to sit in clinic and I'd kind of look at a patient and I'd say, well, you know, I think, you know, I think they're more likely to have nausea or vomiting. Um, but what this would do is it would take all this information that you know I thought of of the patient so it could be their BMI it could be their age it could be um, their gender it would combine the risks of all these factors together and then give you a probability that that patient will suffer that outcome and so you can imagine these models are really useful because they help inform patients if I was a patient in clinic um, and you know I was having making a decision on chemo and um, my actual um, you know the chemo was just to improve my quality of life I think I'd want to know what my risk of hospitalization was through having that chemotherapy and currently you know you can't just pick one factor that will help you determine that it's a combination of lots of different things and it doesn't just mean you know like demographic details about you and your body composition but it could be other things that, such as biomarkers or genetics and you can pull all these into models as well um, they're also used to um, support clinical research as well so you might want to um, add um, and so at the moment in, for breast cancer, for example, um, in the adjuvant setting, there's uh, more dose dense treatments being used. You might want to use these models to determine which patients you put on dose dense treatments, you know, you can get which patients are likely to be delayed or, you know, suffer events. So, um, so in like it allows more informed decisions to be made and improve out improves outcomes. So this is a little bit about the statistics, and um, you know I said we gather lots of factors together to give you an outcome that you choose, um, and all it is is a regression. So you can see on the right that you've got. Um, body weight and height and you know as body weight goes up height goes up you can do this in the same way with multiple factors and it's conceptually the same everything's just you know pulled together as a regression um, and I think that this is where you have to think about the stats um, usually risk models are presented to you in lots of different ways. So um, traditionally people would take this equation, so you have y equals a plus bx there, so where y is your body weight and it's going up with your intercept, which is a, and your um, height. So you can add in more factors to this. So instead of your height, you might have height and age. So you can do plus age and plus this. And that's how it's presented to you as a big equation like that um, with each um, with each factor having its own little coefficient. So how much does this factor really matter when you combine it with everything else? Um, and these equations can be put at the back end of e-prescribing systems so that you just get a probability at the end um, of you know, the likelihood that that patient will have a certain event. 
um, or you can then take these probabilities and categorize them into risks. You can change some of these um, these different coefficients that I talked about with each factor into different scores. So you can give people scores for each factor. So for example, your height, you could say matters twice as much as your, um, as your age. So, um, so you can add lots of different things and usually, um, you know, we use multivariable regression, either using COX if you're using something like survival, where you have a time variable, or logistic, where you've got a kind of yes, no answer. Um, so when I did my PhD, I developed a risk model of dose delays to treatment. And um, these are some of my results. So you can just kind of understand um, what kind of numbers that I was talking about when I developed the model. So when you do develop risk prediction models, you do need really a lot of data. Um, and especially on, you know, the number of events that you're having. So, um, so the reason I developed a model to predict, I used to see problems with dose delays all the time um, because of toxicity um, in practice. And um, I thought a lot of these, these factors for patients were predictable. Um, so I did a literature review and actually found other models um, developed to, um, to predict those more likely to have neutropenic events. Um, but I wanted to look more broadly than that and look at kind of any toxicity related dose delay. And I collected data from four different hospitals in England. And actually here, is, here are some of my results. So I used three different cancers and you can see actually um, across the different hospitals, you can see the rates of delays are quite high, particularly among um, the colorectal cancer patients. And I think mainly because, you know, a lot of them are too weekly. Um, and so this were, these were patients delayed um, by seven days. So you can see it's not kind of a scheduling delay. It's more of a toxicity related delay. Um, when you develop a risk prediction model, you have to, um, at the time, the methods have moved on a little bit in terms of sample size calculation. But generally for every predictor or everything you think that could cause something, you have to have 10 times the number of events for each thing you put, put in. So if I had um, gender female, I'd need at least 10 delays. Then if I had males in, I'd need 20 delays. So you really need a lot of events to be able to predict and the more factors you use. Um, then you kind of, um, in terms of like how my model performed, this is, um, this is actually what the output screen looks like when you, when you build a model. There's lots of things done in between in terms of statistical tests and um, just checking that you're meeting the assumptions in the model and you know, that kind of level of detail is um, crazy and I'm not gonna go into it, but just in terms of basic performance. Now, as you can see, this is like a nice 45 degree line going up. Um, and that means that I've developed the model correctly. Um, it doesn't really mean much else because um, I, that's not a validate, you know, it's, I've used all the data that I had combined and developed my model. Of course, you know, if I've done all the methods correctly, then it's going to be right. Um, and that's called a calibration slope. Um, here are the different um, predicted probabilities grouped, and you can see that they kind of fit on the line. Um, so, so it predicts, you know, in terms of like its prediction, it predicts quite well. Um, in terms of discrimination, does it pick out those that are likely to have the event from those that aren't? Um, it wasn't um, the kind of discrimination um, is kind of fair. It wasn't, it wasn't amazing. And I think because when you choose something like dose delays, you might not always have the right 
factors. So for example, there's a lot of clinician variability in this. Um, so whereas one clinician might delay a patient, another one might not. And when you add in factors like that, then it makes it a little bit difficult to predict. Um, but in terms of its overall performance and its its benefits, it was quite fair. And actually, um, when other models have been um, developed around for the same purpose it, it, in the US, it was pretty um, um, pretty in line with their performance. Um, but actually, in clinical practice, what you care about really is which patients will it benefit, and you know, is there any point in using it? Um, how will it benefit my practice? And um, and actually, with, you know, what happens if it gets it wrong? Because it will sometimes get it wrong. So this is where you do some kind of net benefit analysis. And this shows you, um, this little kind of um, triangle here shows you which patients it's most beneficial for. And when I looked at the different cohorts where those probabilities fell, I figured that actually in the colorectal population, um, receiving first line treatments, this was where the model was um, most useful because it was um, correctly predict predicting 80% of the patients. Um, now it's correctly predicting patients that weren't likely to have any kind of dose delay. So the patients that would go on, have chemo, have chemo, have chemo, you know, the ones that are always fine, but it wasn't very good at picking out those patients that um, were more likely to be delayed. It was, um, so for that reason, it's beneficial in a different way. It's beneficial not to predict those that are likely to be delayed, but it's the patients that you might want to consider using PROMS for, or the patients that you might want to see in clinic every other cycle, rather than every cycle, you can give them a lighter touch approach maybe. Um, so that still needs a little bit of work to work out. Um, also with the breast cancer patients, I'm looking at, um, I talked a bit about um, some people using in the adjuvant setting um, a um, dose dense treatment regimen and um, currently age is used as a bit of a barometer to this so people use the you know when patients are over 65 they don't get it but under 65 they do um, and something like this maybe would could be used in um, an observational study to see if it's a little bit more useful to to identify those patients. Um, so I'm just going to touch on um, some new work that I've been doing, not using statistics, but actually it's the same concept. Um, so a lot of people do talk about deep learning as well. And um, I've been collaborating with a team in Durham using the same data that I used for my PhD, but I didn't actually use some of um, the data that I'd gathered on renal and hepatic results and to look over time at whether patients actually needed those tests. Um, so I, um, so what I did was um, I collaborated with the team with Durham because actually this question was a little bit more complex. You had numerous cycles of treatment, you had, um, and you had lots of um, lots of different regressions going on in the background. So the way um, deep learning works is again, it is a regression, but it's a la more layered effect. So you kind of look at two correlations or three correlations and then you correlate it again. Um, and so that's kind of conceptually how it works. And so for me, statistically, it was a bit more challenging because I'd have to use a bit more of a multi-level approach. Um, but in terms of computer science colleagues, they, they're a bit better at doing that. Um, and so, um, so here um, we know with chemotherapy therapy patients have renal and hepatic um, function tests every, every treatment cycle. But, you know, a lot of the time you sit there and go, do they really need that? Or should I really wait for that before I, you know, sort their chemotherapy out? And, but practices to assess every cycle, um, 
and you know this can cause patient waiting times um, and so what what I looked at firstly was actually how many patients after cycle two have have grade changes in either creatinine or bilirubin and it was actually less than 10 percent of patients so what you're doing is every cycle you're testing the many to catch that 10 percent whereas actually you could just try and develop a model to predict that and so this was quite interesting because we used um, some variables that were from cycle one and cycle two to build this model and um, we used UCLH data to begin with and there were interesting like behavioral things that we added in so for example um, in for the colorectal regimens GCSF isn't a standard for first cycle yet if a, if a clinician adds it in at a first cycle you kind of get that um, impression that they're a little bit more worried about the patient so in in that aspect it's a little bit more um, it adds in some of this clinician variability as well in their their internal predictions um, so we did it for UCLH um, and um, it's it performed really well um, the thing you're really worried about is um, something called false negative so if i if my model says after cycle two don't test each um don't test patients after cycle two for creatinine and bilirubin because they're very unlikely to have any deterioration but actually then it gets it wrong how many times is it getting it wrong and for bilirubin it was um three times out of over five, yeah, it was you know over five hundred patients. I think we had nine hundred and seventy eight patients in total. Um, but yeah, it was only three times it got it wrong, and it was only um, one grade changes. So it wouldn't have meant meant you needed to do anything. But it does need a little bit more refining um, and understanding of what these thresholds should be. So we validated this model in, but with Birmingham data, and actually, it um, it again performs really well so the next steps for that are to try and go for a, an invention for improvement grant where we can develop a little plug-in or you know widget to go at the back end to be prescribing systems to help identify how these patients um, change over time so um, I'm just going to finish there and talk about kind of the future of um, this kind of data you know, risk prediction research, and um, particularly in like the clinical setting. So, so data, um, we've got loads of it at UCLH and, you know, there's a big kind of breadth of data now with everything being linked, but it's got now, you know, we've got the potential now to help personalize treatment decisions. Um, and especially as things get busier, some of these models could really help um, support clinical decisions in practice um they can these models they don't have to be scores every time you see patient that patients that can be quite time consuming they can be built in at the back end of the prescribing systems um but it's really important to understand some of the limitations of use um of some of these models um and critically like where has the data come from if it's just from a single site and it's not really been validated very well you know any kind of you know anyone can develop a model and say it's got great predictions if you're only using you know one set of data it's always going to predict well on the data you've developed on you need to really validate it in some separate data and you do need a lot of events so you know where you have um, patients you know only you're trying to pick out 10 percent of patients you really need to have lots of those patients. Um, why have the factors been used and are they clinically relevant? So when I developed my models, I got um, the factors that I needed through literature reviews, but we know there's like lots of publication bias and, um, and so some things that might be clinically relevant don't don't make it into some models um, what I did for some of my models was I used patient and um, patient and public involvement so 
So I had a few members on my steering groups that said, actually, this is really important and this is really important in different clinicians as well. So, you know, I could push things into the model, even if they came out as non statistically significant. Um, a lot of people, when they develop models and when you're reading um, risk prediction papers, they discount factors when the p-values don't make 0.05. And, and this, isn't, this is really wrong. And the reason is because actually the way prediction models work is they use lots of, lots of predictors together. And these these probabilities change when you put these things together and so you can't just do like univariable screens and so that's not important that's not important because actually it might be important with other factors um, and actually in a lot of the papers that I read for risk prediction models particularly from the US they have discounted some important factors and um, they also um, a lot of papers a lot of people also use age over 65 as a cutoff which actually isn't right and you know you can't arbitrarily just cut age off at a certain level when you can put it in as a as a um as a continuous factor um and overfitting um you know, a lot of the factors that you put into these models have to be manipulated um, to meet some of the assumptions and um, statistical assumptions. But actually, every time you manipulate a factor, you're risking um, your model being too optimistic, too good to be true. Um, and so actually, you just need to be aware of that. Um, so that's that's the end of my talk. I don't know if anyone's got any questions. Yes, well, thank you, thank you so much. So just with the so just with regards to question, if anybody have any questions, please feel free to just drop it in the chat, and then we can pick it up or raise your hand, um, and and then we can um, then you can ask the questions. I guess thinking from a very practical point of view, it seems that first of all. You worked with enormous data sets and across hospital. I wonder from the practical side, what were the challenges or what were of working with so much data across various sites? What was that process like connecting with them and obtaining that yeah, data? I mean, um, it was really important to start with a good protocol and everyone's data looks slightly different. So actually kind of, I think this is where it really helps having that clinical experience because I knew what our data looked like at UCLH, knew what some of the fields meant, and particularly because I was extracting from chemo care at the, you know, and at the time, the blood results when I pulled those from chemo care looked like they, yeah, well, they weren't great, and um, they were all scattered in different fields. Um, and then you go to another hospital and they don't use the same tests as you use. They don't use the same units that you use. So actually then it's kind of trying to figure out, you know, just kind of doing an exercise where you map them and try and bring them together. I mean, what helps is that we all um, contribute to the SAC data set. So there is a little bit of, you know, it is quite uniform in certain ways. So that did help. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, just going through governance for each hospital, going through IG for each hospital, getting all the sign off. So um, a year of my PhD was used getting the um, correct ethics, getting the correct information governance, Caldicott sign offs, um, making sure it's completely anonymized. Um, yeah. So yeah, it was. But it, at the same time, it's really good fun going to different hospitals and learning about their practice and about how they do different things um, and working with different people. Thank you. And uh, we have a question for James Clark. So we said very interesting, Pinky. What next in terms of mapping the patient journey if they don't need certain blood tests every cycle of treatment? That could be a huge capacity release for the NHS. Have you thought about the application of remote blood monitoring via finger prick testing for FPC if we think that the urine is not required each cycle? 
Well, so I'm working with a company actually called um, Seavert. Um, so they're the ones that introduced me to Durham um, and the machine learning team there. So, yeah, so what we're doing is we're getting some patient and public involvement at the moment to try and put in quite a big, big funding pot for something called Invention for Improvement. Um, and what we want to do is we want to develop this tool that can, you know, so part of the stream of work within that programme will be healthy economics and, you know, and different pathways and models of care that can be used. Um, I mean, I'm happy to kind of talk this through in a bit more detail if you know if you want to, co you know, collaborate or, you know, um, I'm always happy for everyone to collaborate. It's not, um, you know, I can see there's going to be a bit, you know, there could be potential, you could do different pathway things and it could bring opportunities for other models as well. I mean, you could start using more proms or you can, yeah, like, like James said, you can use more finger pricks and stuff like that. Because I guess this is my question, and I know you've touched upon it. It sounds like that basically, if you can use it as a widget with the, when administrating the treatment, I guess, how, wh wh what stage is this? Is this, is this application has been discussed with. I mean, what's the kind of like the way forward to integrate it into the various hospitals? So I've spoken to um, a company called iChemo as well, which is an e prescribing system. Um, and they think it, just be really, really easy um, to, to put this model at, you know, at the back end of an e-prescribing system. The only thing is, but um, it's trying to make it universal for every e-prescribing system that has key, like has any chemo, um, and actually, you know, get an authorization. So, you know, where you have Epic, which is American. I'm not sure exactly, you know, and part of this funding will be, you know, how can you make it freely accessible for all and how can all NHS users take advantage of it? Um, the other thing to consider is how do clinicians interact? So if you had um, two cycles of chemotherapy and you're, you know, as a clinician, you're prescribing cycle three ahead and this tool came out and said, you know, your patient doesn't need a kidney or liver function test how do they practically you know go about doing it or will the day be too busy you know how does it actually work in practice because you don't want just another error message coming up at you when you're trying to you know do your job because everyone's really busy so so it's actually about how you how you do that and who does that And I guess talking back about the experience with the team with, uh, with, the, with the, the machine learning in Durham, I guess, what was that experience working with them? And uh, did they have any specific knowledge about your area or were they just providing more the theoretical kind of computational background? And how did you bridge that or interface with them? I think what really helped is the fact that I developed something using statistics and I had an understanding of how the machine learning worked in the first place, because I think one thing that I never wanted to do was collaborate with a team where I really didn't understand, you know, maybe I couldn't apply the methods, but I think, you know, when you do work, when you're doing something for clinical practice, you do want to know what's going, going on in the middle and you want to know that it's actually something that's valid and can be reported in a valid way and so actually having that understanding of statistics really helps me and um, so for example you know when they tell me the performance in terms of a score which is called f1 i'm like well what's f1 i'm used to using c stats as a you know does it and so like i kind of tease out what they mean and they're like oh yeah yeah you know um so they had no, they didn't do anything in cancer. They didn't do anything in, um, they did a little bit in health. They did actually a bit more in um, radiography. So looking at um, x-rays and identifying different things. So um, yeah, but yeah, they were pure computational 
team but super super nice and easy to work with and I think that makes it really um that made it a really nice relationship I mean we're talking about lots of things we can do in future lots of different pharma companies are actually coming to me and saying oh you know we just had this new drug release but it requires loads of blood tests do you think you could apply the same methods and and we can give you all our trial data and you can look at that. So, for example, for the PARP inhibitors, where patients are having weekly blood tests, if we can have all the trial data, we can maybe identify, you know, we can correctly predict those patients that have thrombocytopenia so that the majority don't need all this testing. And I think that's kind of really key. At the moment, we run a service where we do things for everyone to catch, you know, that 10% of the patients, but actually using technology, we might not need to. Thank you. There's a comment from Joe Williams, which I all very much uh, empathize with it, saying, hey, Pink, you really interesting presentation and such amazing work. Like James said, would be a huge capacity really for the NHS looking forward to projects and ideas moving forward into how it can be integrated into our daily prescribing systems and work stream. IKIM is used as a fist, as you know, happy to help where possible. Yeah, thanks, Jay. Yeah, because I guess, you know, did you, is a, if you had to choose the variables that you put into the model, is there anyone that specifically that you would think are would be very helpful to look at moving forward. Um, variables. I think, um, you know, for the dose delays model that I did statistically, I think what was, um, what would be really useful there um, would be um, that clinician, you know, variability, but actually you can get that. So I collected data from four hospitals, but actually you could get that from SAP. So you look at different hospitals, look at their different protocols. Um, I mean, some things that came out um, were, you know, it's like a kind of sideline thing was the fact that, you know, some clinicians use neutrophils of 1.5 in some hospitals standardly. Some clinicians in other hospitals use neutrophils of one. And so actually patients with patients, you know, there's like, geographical disparities you know for the same treatment for the same cancer in the same setting where at one hospital a patient would be delayed where in another they wouldn't and you know for some cancers it's becoming um like more understood that actually that delay does matter and it impacts on dose intensity and could impact on outcomes um so i think that's really important you know to address um, that variation in people's practice and get some consensus. But oh yeah, the other thing was, um, you know, one of um, my patients, um, you know, was felt quite, there was nothing in the evidence about ethnicity and how that impacts on things like dose delays or toxicities. And one of the patients was really quite, um, you know, adamant that that did really matter. Um, but when I was thinking about it after I'd collected my very, I think it was two and a half years into my PhD at this point, and I think it was when all the COVID stuff was going on, I thought, well, actually, it's not really ethnicity, is it? It might be an interaction between ethnicity and deprivation score. Um, and actually, it's not, some things might not be about, you know, your ethnic background, but actually how you culturally are. Um, and I don't know if, you know, I think there's kind of a lot of learning in that as well, and whether you can model that statistically, I'm not sure, you know, because even using those surrogate variables, it might not still capture that, you might need some kind of behavioural score. Which actually was my question as a clinical psychologist, of course, I'm going to ask, though I kind of expect the answer. Was there any, was there any variable regarding to psychological distress? Because uh, I think that's the issue that we're always wondering, with psychological uh, uh, distress and treatment adherence. Was, it, was that factor there in any way? Considering yeah. I know how tricky it is to collect data about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, that as an outcome would be really, really interesting. I mean, what I want to do 
in my next endeavor, my next big kind of model, once I've got these two sorted, is to look at, um, you know, those with more advanced cancers to understand, um, to, you know, because actually in um, a couple of other countries, um, you know, these predictions for these prediction models are being used for advanced cancers and, you know, where a patient has, you know, a high probability that they'll die within a year, they want to really know their risk of hospitalizations within that year because that impacts on their decision making. Um, I don't know if, like, how, if psychological distress would be an actual factor to build into one of these models or whether actually it's more the outcome. So you want to reduce that. Um, but maybe it, you know, maybe it impacts on a patient um, towards a different outcome. Um, yeah, you're right, and adherence, that would be really interesting to look at. There's so many, like once you start learning the methods and you walk around every day going, oh my God, I could do this and I could do that. <laughs> it's only so much time you have. <laughs> Yeah, I think that, well, I think that specifically perhaps more in radiotherapy, that's where we see psychological distress as a, as a, as a tremendous interfering it, uh, factor that can interfere with treatment. I guess just as we wrap it up, you know, you kind of mentioned that you just, that, that you need to finalize the two models. What's the time estimation for that? When would that be completed? Um, yeah, I'd love to say next week. <laughs> Um, so the first model on dose delays is actually kind of um, the next bit is looking at um, kind of what the need is. And I feel like it's a little bit of ahead of its time in some ways, because you know what it's like, you know, if there's not really a pressing need, there's not gonna be that investment in externally validating it. And really external validation should be done by someone completely different to the person that developed it. Um, so it's actually looking for opportunities to do that. I mean, it has got the potential to reduce um, clinic appointments, maybe stratify better those that you see face-to-face um, -face and those that you might see over the phone. Um, so I just kind of need to think that through. Um, I'm pacing on with the renal and hepatic one though. Um, so I'm just putting a paper together to publish that. Um, I've spoken to the research design service. I have industry collaborators, um, as in um, CIVERT and ICHEMO, um, that would be happy to collaborate on um, an application to sort out IPs and patents, because that will be held at UCLH, because it's, um, it's my innovation. Um, but yeah, so... And, you know, like putting all those together, getting a good patient panel, um, but with looking at two year program grants to get it validated across a number of tumours um, and do that research into how clinicians behave when they get, you know, thrown this, thrown this result out at them. And, you know, and then the health economics piece as well about, you know, how much in terms of savings it could add. Um, but it is quite a hot topic at the moment with a shortage of blood tubes and stuff. So, um, so yeah, there is quite a lot of appetite to help with that and help with funding. Yeah, because that was my question. What has been clinician response thus far to your work? Yeah, I mean, um, so with that work, um, I we presented it as an ESMO poster and um, people in the GI team, breast team and um, Martin Forster actually helped um, kind of add some, you know, some kind of clinical backing to it. So, uh, you know, I got them to, uh, we presented the model to them and they were, you know, really enthusiastic about how this could work um, and presented things like the false negatives to them to understand actually the clinical implications of these. Um, and, you know, actually it was, it was interesting because when you present it and they were like, well, we could quite easily pick out these patients. So I think its use isn't going to be something that's definitive as in um, you say, you must not do this, but actually as clinical decision support, because there's some patients you just want to monitor a bit more because, you know, you just, it's just not appropriate not to, and you shouldn't, you should still have that option there for clinicians. Um, 
so yeah, there's still kind of developmental work and stuff to do around that. Um, and then it's actually setting up a clinical study, which is quite exciting um, at the back end of the prescribing systems. And, you know, how does that get costed up and stuff? Well, I've never done anything like this before in um, the US. Um, they found that applied health research and you know non-interventional studies really increased when they started using e-prescribing systems such as Epic and um, Cerna, just because you know things could go in the back end. It wasn't just you know it didn't require lots of resource. So um, trying to build that in um, as well, it's going to be quite interesting. Excellent. Sounds very exciting. Well, Pinky, to echo the sentiment in the chat, thank you so much for today. Um, really fantastic presentation and such an exciting prospect um, for the work and for research. So very much looking forward to continue being in contact and hearing more about it. Um, I'm just going to now pop in the chat our survey. Please feel free to enter it now and give us any sort of feedback. We will greatly appreciate it. And also to say that our next SCRAF presentation will be on Thursday, 18th of November by Dr. Annika Petrella, who's a very close colleague of mine, who's going to talk about her research experience of how to engage young men in survivorship care and how to consider tailored approach uh, from her experience of doing really magnificent psychological piece back in Canada. So thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Pinky, first of all. And thank you, everybody, for joining. Looking forward to meet again in November. We will send details with the YouTube links for Pinky's presentation and with the details of the next event, right? Thank you. Bye. Thank you.